uh, September 19th Technical Coordinating Committee meeting is called to order. Um, first item is public comment. Are there any members of the pu public wishing to comment? All right, seeing none. Um, do we have a motion to approve? Oh, let's have some self introductions. <laughs> All right, self introductions. We'll start on the left, on my left. Abhishek Parikh, City of Congar. Uh, Heather Ballinger, City of Walnut Creek, representing uh, City County Engineers. Jerry Fay, County. Steve Kirsch of Ann Brentwood. Uh, Andy Smith, City of Walnut Creek, representing Transpac. Nathan Landau, AC Transit, subbing for Jim Conradi. Paul Reinders, representing Transplan. Yvette Ortiz, City of El Cerrito and uh, West Big Tech. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Hughes, City of Pleasant Hill, representing Transpac. Andy Dillard, Danville, SWAT. Jill Mercurio, City of San Pablo. If she's West WICTAC, I must be North WICTAC. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leah Greenblatt, just plain WICTAC. <laughs> <laughs> Ricky Wells, Bart, subbing for Michael Tanner. And Lisa Babadia, San Ramon, also representing SWAT. All right, let's get going. Uh, approval of summary of actions uh, from June 20th. Last meeting is in June. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. All approve? Yep. Aye. Any opposed? All right, approved. Uh, next, we have the consent calendar. Uh, do we have a motion for, or do we have any items that have discussion on the consent calendar? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. And all approve? Aye. And any opposed? Seeing none, we'll approve that. Next item is the project, I'm sorry, yeah, project monitoring. Stephanie. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the regular item for the project monitoring. Um, so just to highlight, um, the FY 1920 obligation plan has been in the works with MTC for the past couple of months, and it's being finalized, and the MTC staff is going to present it to their commission later this month. Um, I've been working with jurisdictions that have the um, such projects program for fiscal year 1920, so I think everything is set in any order. Um, and those uh, projects can be found in the tables in the attachments. So it would be page um, 4.7. Um, the other tables sort of is the standard um, monitoring tables and just also uh, for you to highlight the um, inactive project list, of course, that I preach regularly to hopefully now make these, this list shorter and that we're invoicing regularly um, so that to, to avoid being on this list. Um, one thing I did want to mention um, is the November 1st request for authorization deadline um, for projects that are programmed this year. Normally, I will tell you guys to submit your RFA by November 1st. Um, that's sort of been the regional deadline for a long time now. Um, in the staff report, I've noted that that deadline is suspended per MTC. What's happening is that people are meeting this regional deadline of November 1st, but they get the money, but they don't go out for award um, for that six. You have to award your contract within six months, and people are missing that and therefore missing the invoicing deadline. So while people are trying to meet the regional deadline of the November 1st RFA deadline, they're missing the subsequent federal deadlines for invoicing an award. So they're suspending the November 1st deadline. However, the, the deadline of obligating the funds by January 31st, 2020 still holds because after that, the funds sort of become first come, first served. So it's your best interest to obligate your funds before January 31st. So which kind of pushes you back to November anyway, but they are not holding the November 1st deadline. So I, my recommendation to you guys or whoever has projects or federal projects to, while this suspension is happening, that you submit your RFA sometime in November that gives you a couple months to get your money before January 31st. 
Hopefully that now makes sense. Um, so the working group will continue to refine the resolution 3606, which is a MTC resolution that kind of lays out all the milestone delivery milestones. Um, so if you guys have any um, feedback that you want me to take back to the working group as they refine the requirements, I'm happy to take them with me when we meet um, quarterly now. Um, so if you guys have any feedback in terms of, you know, you guys are the one delivering the projects and trying to meet the deadline. So if you guys have any feedback or um, suggestions on how to make these milestone delivery deadlines um, more, efficient, more effective, I guess, um, let me know offline or email me. And that's it for my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, next item is yours, the two, 2020 STIP candidate projects. Um, so I have a handout, so one second. So the um, the ranking and scoring of the STIP process is being passed out as a handout. We met. We had a we had two meetings. We had a second meeting just this Tuesday, these two days ago. So we didn't make the packet production. So therefore, we're here passing it out in person. So um, so I'll begin as the handouts getting to you guys. So on 15, May 15th, the authority issued the COFA project for 2020 STIP. On June 24th, the CTC released a draft, an estimate, which showed very limited programming capacity, which led us, the authority, um, canceling the COFA projects on November, sorry, on July 3rd. Subsequently, CTC caught an error in the original draft fund estimate and released a revised draft estimate on July 12, showing a modest capacity for programming for Contra Costa. We then reissued the COFA projects on July 15th, with the due date postponed to August 9th to allow more time for applicants to pull their applications together. The final fund estimate was approved by the CTC on August 14th. There is approximately 36.25 million for new programming for Contra Costa in the 2020 STIP, but we have to take account um, of the following. The 31, there's 31.1 million um, kind of set aside to pay back the American Recover Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARA funds, for the Caldano project. Um, back in 2009, in order to expedite the delivery of the Caldecott project, we had to borrow future stiff funds from MTC, and this is a payback for, for that um, transaction. And then there's also a $563,000 for two years of planning, programming, and monitoring activity, activities for authority staff and MTC staff. So taking into account of those two deductions, we're left at $4.6 million in the 2020 stiff for new project programming in fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25. In response to the call for projects, the authority received six applications, totaling 15.8 million in requests. Nine members of the TCC or the staff of the TCC members served on the evaluation committee, and the people who have bravely volunteered are shown on page 5.3. The subcommittee met over two days on August 29th and, July, and September 17 to evaluate the project applications. CCTA staff did not evaluate the pro um, score any projects, but we were there to um, facilitate discussion and also provide information. The subcommittee was divided into two groups, and they scored the projects independently, and then they come together to reach a consensus score and compare scores for consistency. The subcommittee then have an opportunity to discuss any individual projects if needed um, to reach a consensus. The members review all six projects except for the applications submitted by their own jurisdictions. And then if you look at the um, table, the very last project, there is no score indicated because the committee determined that this project was not eligible to compete for funding because their funding plan did not have all secured fund sources. One of the criteria um, that was in the application material is that um, 
the project phase of the project seeking the STIP funding has to be fully funded with the STIP funding requested and or and additional fund sources if there are any. So um, for this particular project, the Hercules Regional Intermodal Transit Center, the building, uh, station building, their funding plan did not show all fund sources that were secured. So therefore, they were determined ineligible to compete for the funds. The expected 4.6 million can sufficiently um, fund the top two projects, which are the SR4 operational improvements in a westbound direction between just west of Port Chicago and just east of Willow Pass Road. And the second ranked project is Treat Boulevard corridor improvements from North Main to Jones, which will provide safer facilities for bicyclists and pedestrians by modifying the geometrics and also provide better multimodal balance and while maintaining the corridor performance. So this is just outside our building here. So, and that's um, by the county. So this is the score and our um, this recommendation from the committee and I'm asking, staff is asking for approval of their recommendation and for it to be forwarded to APC and board for approval in October. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. No questions? I, yeah, go I'm, ahead. Oh, go ahead, Yvette. I, I just had a question about the first project. If you could describe what type of operational improvements and the, the, the funding kind of uh, makeup for that sure. environmental it's phase? It's an environmental phase, so the, the project was seeking just the environmental clearance phase, so that's uh, the three million fo will fully fund that activity. Um, there's no other fund sources on that project. Um, we had gone through the PID process to get <clears throat> to finish the PSR document for the entire corridor. Um, so the it, it, stop me if you're uh, it was basically the project in itself has multiple packages. There's eastbound packages and westbound packages, and this application is just for the first two westbound packages from Port Chicago to Willow Pass Road, and the improvements include um, additional ox lanes. Um, and improvements on the um, on the ramps, creating another ramp exit lane at Port Chicago, and the split of 242 and four. There will be a extra lane to go either way inst instead of now. There's two, I think. Welcome. Uh, my question is also related to that project. I I recall, and maybe I'm just not remembering correctly, but I recall during Measure J discussions that there was a swap for funding for East County because the authority prioritized EBART and the Highway 4. Steve's shaking his yeah. head yes, right? So, so there was a swap, and East County wasn't eligible for STIP funding for a number to, of years. Right, so. so this was in the April TCC meeting when we, before we released the call, um, we did highlight that last cycle was the last cycle that okay. East County can no longer compete for the okay. funding. Okay, so they're eligible this cycle then? Correct. Okay. Though this was, I think the, it was the East County jurisdictions, so this project is sponsored by CCTA. However, it's a moot point because the yeah, last cycle was the last cycle that um, East County was precluded from, okay. excluded from competing. All right, thank you. Questions? Okay. Any other questions? If not, go ahead. Uh, just a statement. Um, I'm going to be actually voting no on this because of the uh, Treat Boulevard project. Uh, City of Walnut Creek, our traffic engineering and transportation planning, expressed quite a bit of concern over the design of this, uh, the, the uh, selected um, scheme uh, and uh, or option. Um, basically that uh, the, the improvements for the bike facilities are coming at a great expense to uh, the road network, uh, impacting both auto and uh, bus transit um, throughput and potentially safety and backing up onto this, the main line of I-680 uh, due to some changes to the off-ramp. Um, and there were other design alternatives that uh, were rejected that uh, we felt could adequately address the uh, bike infrastructure needed, admittedly, but definitely needed in the area while not having the negative impact on the um, on the roadway network, so for that reason, I'll be voting no. Yeah, I'll just comment further on that because we've gotten some complaints. Uh, I'm not sure 
even how, maybe it was this application, but some we had some um, inquiries from citizens that were asking about this project and wanting to know the status, and so there's been a, not a lot of controversy, but some controversy. So it's not that, in my mind, that we're objecting to the process or whatever, but it's just that the project still has some um, heartache for us, I guess. Or Yeah, basically the selected design option. Yeah. So, but it, I don't think it's designed yet either. So, and I know this is future year funding. Jerry just reminded me of that. So, I don't. Yeah, the funding is, I should have added that. The funding is for fiscal, maybe I did, 24, 25. So those are four years away. So I don't know if you have engaged the county um, staff about your comments or your concerns. I'm hoping that they could be worked out. Your concerns could be worked out in the meantime. Um, <laughs> Jerry's right there. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping. <laughs> the objections are are they um, again on the on the objective of the project? Is that the objection of? To the objective? Of no, the not at all. Not at all. It, it's it's uh, you know the ends are perfectly fine. It's the okay. means. Okay, so perhaps. And it's basically it was a design. You know, the, the county came up. I think it was originally with four different design alternatives, and oh. then from number four they split it into two or three sub alternatives, and it was one of those that was chosen. Um, and and it's basically that that design that you know preliminary, albeit, but that design is uh, where we're, we had issue. And we did, of course, work you know through the the process with. Um, with the county. All right, thanks. Uh, any other questions, comments? All right, do we have a motion on this item? Not from all I'm going to backtrack and ask a, a question, if I may. Um, I, we haven't really heard from the county. Is it possible that the city's uh, concerns could be addressed still? Is, What's the timing for that? I guess I really don't know the different what option you were looking at versus what option got put forth. So, but I mean, if there's tweaks that be get that could be done to the project as it gets designed, I'm, I'm sure um, we could look at that. But I think one of the, I mean, Heather just mentioned that one of the uh, couple of key ingredients of this is like these free rights, getting rid of these free rights, like outside this building, mm -hmm. we've got this sweeping right and emerge, so it gets rid of that one. Uh, the other is coming off the freeway. Um, where you get the free right and then people kind of panic and don't know if they should merge or stay in the right. Um, so that free right, work, the group worked with Caltrans to kind of get a blessing on, on making that a more standard intersection. So I don't know what components, I mean, you mentioned that, um, but I think those are the key components of it is to, to kind of get rid of those merges as they get off the freeway and then as they get, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, Oak on to Treat going the other way. And then... To me, the big one is uh, removal of the travel lane, the, what was it, the fourth travel lane on Treat between Oak and Jones to create a bike um, bike boulevard. So there's a lot of different components of it. So as it goes through design, I'm sure Walnut Creek is going to be involved. I don't know what I'll say. Yeah. Thanks. Being, being on a scoring, scoring committee, I, I did feel it was a good project in that it was moving towards this complete streets and multimodal paradigm that we're moving into with BMT and all that. So I thought it was a good project. I just surprised that uh, we have objection to the design. So I hope that can be worked out. Um, yeah, I also, also wanted to add that the step money is for construction. So hopefully there's enough time to address the issues that have been brought up in during the design fine. phase and hopefully this project can be implemented. But yeah, I, I would concur with what Paul and Leah said, that everyone seemed to really like the project and want the improve, pr improvements made um, for this corridor. So I'm hopeful that the concerns can be addressed in, in the four years that we have. <laughs> Eric. I guess one question. Um, I know it's the project, the planning phase of it through all different alignments that's been going on for the past couple of years. Didn't County Board of Supervisors actually approve a uh, whatever the final 
option, I guess, <laughs> out of the three or four that was? Um, yeah, I don't know if they actually approved it or just accepted the study that was done. I mean, I don't remember the action they took, but yes, they approved that concept. That concept. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. Do we have a motion? All right. Subcommittee. Subcommittee. Thank you. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Leah. All right. All approve. Yes. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. No. That's two. Any others? Uh, and any abstain? Abstain? No. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Our next item is the the Bay Area Rapid Transit Public a Public Transit Access Safe Routes to BART Grant Program in Development. Hi, it's my name's on the item, but I'm not presenting. I'm here to just introduce Rachel Factor from BART, who will be giving us more information about Safe Route to BART grant program, and hopefully that means some money for us or for them. Uh, so I'm I know they are happy to see you and happy to hear what you have to say. Welcome, Rachel. Can y'all hear me? No. How do I? Oh, great. Now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, just one second. And that appears there? It does. Okay. But let's get the screen on. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, so just move mm -hmm. there. Okay. All this technology. All right. Well, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, this should be a pretty brief presentation, five, ten minutes, and then it'd uh, be great to get some, some feedback on this program. Um, so I handed out a copy of the presentation for everybody, and there's also an extra form that I'll get to at the end. Um, so, uh, well, BART uh, received $3.5 billion in Measure RR bonds, and uh, most of the bond is for state of good repair. Um, so we're doing a lot of work right now. You probably all, all probably know about it. Um, and we were able to carve out about $135 million for access, um, and that's for new capital projects to improve access to our stations. Um, so actually, let me get to, I'm kind of jumping the gun here. Um, before I get to that, BART has a, a station access policy that was adopted in 2016, and the idea here is to really encourage um, healthier, safer access to our stations, uh, try to shift from driving and parking alone to more sustainable modes of transportation. Um, and from that policy, our board adopted these performance targets, multiple performance targets, and uh, here is one of the main difficult targets that we're trying to achieve, which is uh, shifting our active access walk-bike share from 44% based on our 2015 station access survey data to about 52%. Um, so. In 2008, we were able to, we see, have statistics from 2008, and we were at 35% then, and we were able to increase to 44% because our drive and park share went from 34% to 27%. And really, uh, BARD was doing some access improvements, but the main reason for this was because our ridership increased significantly, and we didn't expand our parking. Since then, our ridership has um, stagnated, and we have increased parking. So... It's going to be really tough to achieve these targets, but we have to do everything we can to try to get there. And um, we, so this is how we were able to carve out some of the the funding in the bond program. Unfortunately, it's not all 3.5 billion. That would be great, but at least we have something. And um, this is how uh, the four percent of the bond measure for the access program is divided up. And um, since our focus really is primarily on shifting from drive and park to active access or shared mobility, uh, most of the pot is going to access, active access. So it's about $77 million allocated to that. And of that, we were able to carve out $25 million for this program. And um, really, uh, part of the access program and what we committed to the board was that 
and to the public was that we'd be leveraging outside funding to make our 135 million extend as far as possible and developing this grant program to um, encourage better access to our stations is another way of leveraging funding. Um, so here's a, a brief overview of where we're trying to get with the program and some, some of our program goals. Um, so really, we're trying to help our partner agencies implement active access capital projects. That's important, the bond measures for capital only projects. And uh, to support our access policy to make it easier and safer for people to get to our stations. And there's a number of program goals here. I'm not going to read through them all. Um, but these, these goals will be uh, directly tied to our evaluation criteria, which I'll get to in, in, in a few slides. Um, so just highlighting a couple here, uh, we are going to be looking for cities that are uh, really ready for TOD development in the, you know, around the catchment area of the station. So we would be um, providing more points to those cities and also um, demonstrating leveraging of other funding sources for the program. Um, oh, and then another one that's very important is that the, it has to be a very clear nexus to, a, to our station. So the project can't be two miles away. It has to be either adjacent to or make a very good case for um, making a good connection to our station, closing a gap with a bridge or something like that. Um, so some of the details, and just to be very clear, we're at the beginning stages of it, this program, and one of the main reasons we're here today is to really get input from all of you. Um, this is the first time BART is doing a grant program, so I'm a novice in this, and, um, and the agency is, and so we're really looking for input from, we've, we've reached, we've gotten a lot of input from our grants group, and uh, a lot of other internal stakeholders, and we've reached out to the CMAs and MTC, so we've gotten a lot of input so far, but, you know, really the next step was, you know, what do the cities think of this, and, you know, what kind of, um, uh, how can we make this program good for everybody? So just a couple things. One is that we want to make it really easy, as easy as it can be, um, uh, for applicants. So I know that there, the, these grant programs require a lot of work. I'm applying for some myself, and it's a lot, <laughs> and I know everybody has a lot of, um, a lot of other work to do, so trying to make it as simple as possible uh, for everybody to apply and also for us to administer, again, because we're not, this is not our, um, it's not typically what BART does. So uh, this, so here are some details, and again, some of these may change a little bit, and with the input that we're getting from people. Um, so this will be a competitive grant program for up to approximately $25 million. Uh, the number and frequency of cycles is not determined yet. We know we definitely know we're doing one cycle, and we're thinking that's the first one's going to be around five million to kind of pilot this to see how what the response is and um, what kinds of projects we get out of it, and then based on that we determine what the next cycles would be. And this five million could be if we get ten amazing projects, maybe we're going to increase that to ten million. If we get three decent projects then, or three good projects, we'd make it three million. It's not, we're not clear on that yet, but our target is five million. Um, so we're thinking something between 500 to 1.5 million uh, as our range. And uh, again, if there is a really amazing project out there to close a construction gap um, and you, uh, some, a city needs $200,000, we'd probably be open to that. So I think we have, we want to put flexibility into this program in case um, there are some good opportunities that don't necessarily meet the, the, these requirements perfectly. Um, so we're trying, we're hoping to launch by winter 2020. Don't hold me to that because that will be based on board decisions and uh, executive management decisions. So we're trying to push as fast as we can at a staff level. Um, we're looking for one project submission per BART station. So Hayward, there would be two, for example. That's probably not a good example for Contra Costa. But um, I'm thinking of a Contra Costa. Oh, Pittsburgh would be two. So, oh, and El Cerrito would be two. Right. Um, and we hope to be actively involved during the application process to ensure that we're getting, you know, we're being able to advise well and, and also getting good applications. And also, we will be involved in the project development. Um, you know, we will do as much as we can, noting that there's a lot of staff constraints and this program is not uh, 200 million, unfortunately. Um, but we would probably get involved a little bit in the design review and making sure that the connections to BARD make sense and that, you know, there's probably going to be um, some work there. 
unfortunately, we do require, we will have to require monthly reporting. I heard from many, um, from all the CMAs and from MTC and from our grants group that monthly reporting is too much, but um, I can't get out of that <laughs> just based on BART's requirements and our, our, our oversight committee requirements. But our monthly reporting is pretty simple. So if there's nothing to report, it's just going to be NA, and um, we provide we will provide the financial information. So it shouldn't be a huge lift. Um, and we also will require a non-federal local small business program. So this, I believe, it's for uh, uh, for local the local component of it. I believe it's for counties. I have to confirm that, but it's um, the uh, San Francisco, San, uh, San Mateo, Contra Costa, and Alameda County. I think I'm. It may be just the three counties or it may be the five. I have to just confirm that one. Um, so eligibility requirements, uh, we, would, we are looking for near-term walk and bike infrastructure improvements that demonstrate this clear nexus. We want these to be enduring projects. So, um, you know, ideally projects that won't require a lot of maintenance and we're not looking for this um, uh, you know, experimental painting projects. We're looking for more well, long-term capital investment. Um, have to be located 100% within the boundaries of the three counties. San Mateo is not included here. We're looking for a minimum design of 35%, and construction is eligible as well. Uh, we're looking for at least 30% match. Um, you'll see that leverage, leveraging funding is one of our evaluation criteria, so the more funding provided, the higher it's going to score on that criteria. Um, we need to have some evidence of demonstrated governing support. So this could be a letter from city manager, or, or we realize that city council resolutions are really rough, so we're not probably, you know, I don't anticipate getting those, but um, whatever letters of support that can show that the, the city is really um, invested in this project and uh, they have skin in the, the city has skin in the game and that the project will actually be completed. We will require a funding plan and also a delivery plan with, with some scheduled milestones and timelines. And um, I forgot to include on the slide, but we're looking for, because it's uh, the bond and we, ha we have a commitment to finish the projects that we start. If we don't, then we have to pay back whatever we've received from the public with our operating funds, which is never good news for every anyone. Um, we are trying to set a goal of if it's a design project, three years for completion, and if it's a construction project, a year and a half for completion. Again, there may be some flexibility there, but we would like to actually uh, to at least have some goals. Um, so these are some of the eligible improvements and examples of projects. So on the left is um, uh, eligible projects. Excuse me. So um, things like public plazas, signage, wayfinding, pedestrian scale lighting, bike parking, uh, tr uh, class four um, bike lanes, so so on and so forth, and complete streets. And then on the right side are some project examples. These would be really well scoring projects, um, especially if they meet the equity targets and um, if they're in TOD friendly environments. Um, so like a pedestrian scale lighting that illuminates dark underpass that serves as a key pedestrian route to a BART station, a class four cycle track, or road diet, um, including things like uh, signaling to improve bike and ped safety. And just a note at the bottom, uh, ART is, def is an eligible expense for our BART um, measure RR funds, and we would encourage projects with ART components as a functional part of design. Um, so our selection committee will be multiple departments internally. Um, so it would be stationary planning, that's where I'm from, uh, customer access, um, and a couple other groups. And then external, we're going to have CMA participation and include some advocacy groups. We are going, these are our initial seven criteria. On the left side is our station access policy goals, just to, to explain why we've chosen these criteria is the criteria directly linked to those goals. And these are basically a repeat of what I showed initially um, with the goals of the program. And then the final selection after the projects have been scored, we'll, we're going to take a look at the current and aspirational station types per our access policy. And we'll make sure that there's some kind of balance there. And we're also going to look at um, whether we can take advantage of the construction of off-site projects with other major improvements that are planned. 
and here's our tentative schedule, tentative being very much tentative. <laughs> um, so we're here at the top looking for framework uh, feedback and then we plan to advertise the project in the winter and release the call for projects. I'll probably show up here again to let everybody know it's coming. Um, then uh, spring 2020 would be the deadline for the applications and the f hopefully we'd get our board to uh, approve by summer fall 2020 and then initiate projects by the fall in 2020. And this is a uh, slide is the form that I passed out. So really um, here, this is not a requirement to submit an inquiry form. It's This is really just to help us understand what kinds of projects um, the cities would be interested in using these grant funds for. And this will help us also calibrate if we re we receive this very soon, will help us calibrate what I will be bringing to the board um, and the requirements that are in the program. I'm hoping, I have a meeting with our GM early October, so the sooner I can get in forms and get input, the, the, you know, the more input I'll give to him, and then um, I'm hoping to get to our board in late October to get the program funding approval. Um, so if I put a deadline there, it's September 30th, because that's pretty much when, I'm sorry I'm getting to you guys kind of late, and that's uh, not giving you much time, but even if you just fill in some of it, just give me some ideas, it will be really helpful. Um, that's it. All right, I, two quick questions. Uh, who's eligible for these funds? Is it just cities and county, or? Um, cities, counties, agencies, any public agency, if they have walk, bike, um, infrastructure projects. Near a BART station. Near a BART station. All right, and is right-of-way um, cost eligible? That is a good question. Um, to be determined? TBD, yeah, I have to, the, I have to confirm with legal. All right, do we have any other questions from the committee? Eric? Um, on one of your slides for the uh, access mode share data, I'm assuming that's system-wide, right? That's system-wide, yeah. Okay, do you guys have a similar analysis for individual stations? Yes. Okay, just maybe a comment um, or something to think about. Um, obviously, there are certain stations specifically I'm talking generally, of course. In uh, San Francisco, obviously, a lot. I'm assuming there are a lot more bike and ped um, percentages uh, versus out here in Contra Costa. Yeah. I mean, the number is going to be slightly different. Um, but something to consider in terms of prioritizing. I mean, is your goal going to be, if you have a, for example, ped, bike and ped project near a bar station in San Francisco where I'm going to throw out a number where 60% of the users are already biking, walking and biking because of the yeah. locations they're in versus a similar type project in Contra Costa County mm -hmm. where primarily 80% of the people are driving to that particular a, a particular station. Is there a particular criteria to differentiate the two scenarios? Yes. Um, um, so this one, the first... Line. Sorry, I'm sort of semi-blind here. I should probably just look at my slides. Um, but this first criteria to enhance our customer experience, and this is really at the end of it, it says to shift people from driving and parking to walking and biking. So actually, Contra Costa probably score better than San Francisco unless it's Glen Park um, right. because San Francisco doesn't have parking. Um, so then, and we're going to be weighing this criteria pretty high. So we really are looking to shift the needle on access. Um, is there any thought by BART to allowing some of these funds to be used for first or last mile, whether it's on-demand service, to get people to and from the station via shuttles or on-demand? So no. it's all capital all construction. Capital. So what about the cities that aren't eligible? I mean, there's a number of cities in this county that are not along a BART line. so. By default, we're not eligible. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jason, I think it's next. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no. I don't know. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> Leah, you're next. Um, I had uh, two questions sort of related. Um, have you guys discussed at all how you um, might 
make sure that there's, um, you know, that the projects are spread uh, throughout the region, the ones that are selected? Yeah, so we are going to look for geographic equity, um, but not necessarily if we're going to do, let's say, for four cycles. It could be that contract cost, if we award five, it could be that contract cost gets four and San Francisco gets one in the first cycle, and then we would try to balance that with Alameda County in the next cycle. Just really, um, we'll, we hope to get geographic equity per cycle, but we can't make that commitment. We have to see what we get. Uh, but that would be one of our goals. And just actually going back, sorry, to go back to your question, I thought about it a little bit more. Um, if you were to partner with another city who had, like if you were doing Iron Horse Trail, for example, and trying to close a gap in one segment and then another city were closing a gap closer to BART, then that might be, that might be something to consider. Sure. And then um, my other question had to do with um, how you might be um, considering communities of concern as you score these applications? Yeah, so we have um, our fourth criteria is about equitable services, and this is really looking to provide equitable access to disadvantaged communities. And this will be using, we have um, um, data about income levels, and also we could use the, you could use the community of concern um, MTC mapping. Uh, a comment and a question. A comment, Eric, it was interesting to hear your question because back when we were doing say, the say, MTC Safe Routes to Transit program, that's exactly the kind of question that came up and people would would uh, discuss about and they would discuss, well, gee, is it worthwhile to put a sidewalk connector in Vacaville, you know, where the transit ridership is low, but it's really, it's hard to do otherwise. I, I guess my question, one thing that it seems to be different about this potential program than Safer Ask the Transit is that the applicant needs to come in with a 30% design. So really what you're saying is this is a project, these need to be projects that are a fair way along. Yeah. You don't want them to come in with like what might be a good idea or it might be a bad idea, but you really want things that are a fair distance along. We need to have, I don't think that our board would be favorable to conceptual design just because then it's less, it might be less likely that it is actually completed. And again, we would have to pay back the bonds with operating funds. So I think we need to see that there's a lot of skin in the game in this. Well, well I'll just say a lot of safe routes to transit projects were built. I think of what was done in Concord and Monument Boulevard coming up to Concord BART. A lot of those were connection to BART projects, not all of them, but mm -hmm. so. That's a good point. I had a question along this, all along the same lines. So we did a BART access study uh, in 2017, and BART was leading that project. What uh, city, sorry? Concord. Okay. So BART led the project, and we provided input, and we did a walk tour and came up with a number of projects uh, that would provide better, better and safe access to the BART station. Mm -hmm. Obviously, none of those are in design. Right. But would that qualify, uh, given that those were projects that were identified in collaboration with BART? And uh, we'd be very interested in you know pursuing those further. They would definitely score well in the um, on in the criteria number three, and just collaborating collaboration and with the community and with BART. Um, we, but we will, and the, one of the reasons why I wanted to to announce that we we're doing this program sooner than later was so that cities could try to invest and try to get to some level of design ready. And th and that and is those, a possibility, but you know, saying thirty five percent design ready is just not enough time to get there. Right. So this is the kind of input we're looking for. So if a winter launch date is not, you know, if we hear from a lot of cities that winter 2020 is just too soon to get any, you know, get any submissions ready, then we may reconsider that launch date. Okay. Um, it, it's really just dependent on the feedback that we're going to get. Oh, uh, thanks. Sure. So, uh, if I could follow up to the geographic uh, distribution question. So, uh, um, 
it's $25 million available in the three counties. I think there's like 40 BART stations, give or take, you know, a little over 600 grand each if every one of them were to get the same amount. Mm -hmm. Hence the 500 grand to one and a quarter million. But is, is there any thought one way or the other about, well, you know, if we get applications, every station should get something? Or is the thought maybe, well, maybe not everybody gets something? Um, it's pretty likely not everybody's going to get something because we're really looking for impactful projects that could actually change people's behavior, encourage people to stop driving and start walking and biking. So, you know, if we spread it out too much, it's probably not going to, we're not going to be able to do too much, unfortunately. Like I said, I wish this was a lot more money. It should be a lot more money. But you'll only, but only <laughs> one project per station will be funded. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. One, yeah, one project per station, that's the applications we could get. I'm sorry, maybe funded. Yeah. It, can I ask a couple questions? Is that per cycle? Uh, that is per cycle. Okay. Um, just, I, I need to explain that. We'll see how this cycle goes, uh -huh. and then we're going to probably rethink some of the things that we're doing here. And so that may change for the next cycle. But initially, the thought is that it would be one per station per cycle. And then just going back to the timing, um, maybe one thought is when you get, if you do get some um, in good information on this summary or this uh, request that you've put out, mm -hmm. um, maybe we could see that. Because um, if, the, if we were supposed to have 35% done, design completed, before we can put the application in, it's like you're taking a leap of faith. Right. right. And so if you knew that there was a whole bunch of projects out there that were really already in design and already, um, you know, probably more likely to be funded, then yeah. it might not be worth it. Mm -hmm. But if there's, you're thinking, oh, there's maybe some money out there that could be had because yeah. the competition isn't stiff, yeah, then maybe it might be worth it. You know, That's a really good point. I think we should do that. I'm very very empathetic to these things because it's painful to apply for grants <laughs> and you just want to know are you going to get the money or not <laughs> so all right eric uh, just one last question for me um i know you guys are very cooking this as a go so to speak um any idea of the the spacing time wise between the cycles um so if it's not an administrative nightmare then <laughs> and our board is easy going um, I would try to aim for once a year. I, whatever we do, I want it to be predictable. So if it's two years, then I would get, I'd let the cities know it will be in two years because that's also a very frustrating thing about grants that you have no idea when many of them are going to actually happen. So that's my goal. I would like to do it once a year if it's not too hard. Okay, so, so that's the discussion that's yet to be had internally on your end. Yeah, I think okay. we're really going to have to see how this cycle goes. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I have one. Um, in terms of one project per station, I as well, I should ask this as a question rather than make it as a statement. <laughs> Could a city come in if they were so positioned and say, well, we can provide access from two or three directions. It's, it's two or three physical pieces that would serve this station, that, that serve as our one project? That would be, I, I'm totally for bundling projects, but just keeping in mind that we only have up to 1.5 million. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, uh, I mean, let's, I'll, I'll play pretend, you know, maybe the city's got some of its own public works money to put in or something. Yeah. No, if there was something, you know, just a, I don't know, five or six elements that would improve station access in the immediate area, that would be, to me, that would be a project. Um, I had another thought. Oh, one other thing is that um, systemic, if there is a city with multiple stations, systemic improvements like lighting at each station could be considered an application for one and then do another application for the other station. We just need your email address to send this to you. If I missed it, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, you, can I just say it? Because I don't think I – I didn't write it anymore. Um, it's <laughs> R Factor. So R for Rachel. Factor is F as in Frank, A-C-T-O-R, 
at bart.gov. And I can, um, I can, I'll follow up with um, Stephanie, maybe, and send the project inquiry form. Did I resend it to you electronically? Okay. So I'll send it to Stephanie electronically. Yeah. Stephanie, you'll send her email as well. Yeah, feel free to uh, follow up with any questions. Um, any other questions? Thank you. And I just have to let you all know that I've now done this to each of the transportation working groups for the other CMAs, and you definitely win for most feedback. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know if that's good. Will that be reflected in the amount of grant funding we get? <laughs> we do. More money? We're just getting started. <laughs> Ask for more money. <laughs> well, thank you, Rachel. Sure. Our next item is the request for volunteers to serve on the Vision Zero Working Group to develop the cost of Vision Zero framework and systemic safety approach. For this, we have James. Thank you, Chair and Committee. Uh, the item before you is an invitation for volunteers on the Vision Zero Working Group. And as a reminder to this committee, for those who have been following along in July, the board authorized uh, work plan for the planning division here at CCTA, which includes developing a, a Vision Zero framework and systemic safety approach that will conclude or is scheduled to conclude at the end of next calendar year, at the end of 2020. And with the objective being to deliver uh, technical procedures to implement Vision Zero principles throughout Contra Costa County. And so uh, part of the scope of work that is provided uh, attached to this report, uh, we are requesting a number of volunteers to serve on a working group that would help supervise uh, the consultant and staff's uh, work in developing this framework and systemic safety approach. The meetings at this time are roughly scheduled on a bi-monthly basis, so every other month with the first one aiming to occur sometime before Thanksgiving in the early to mid-November time frame. That may slide depending on how quickly we can form the group and uh, collect our data to help get this uh, project kicked off. Uh, <clears throat> The request is specific in the sense that uh, we are asking for four members from this committee and we are uh, proposing that each of the four, or put another way, um, each RTPC is represented. So one volunteer from TCC from each RTPC. Um, and we understand that if we, we would love to have nominations today or, or volunteers to offer today, but if you feel that you need to speak to your RTPC colleague to get a more formal uh, volunteer nomination, then, then we can uh, accommodate that as well. So I will uh, leave it to the committee to make nominations or otherwise advise if they need more time. We'll start off simple. Are there any nominations? Heather. Um, I just have a question. Please. So not to be negative, but if for some reason the TEP doesn't pass March 2020, is this even needed? Or is Vision Zero going to be in concert with Measure oh, yes. J? Or is it just if the new measure passes? This, um, it is a complement to the Vision Zero policy in the proposed TEP uh, right now. But if it does not pass on the March ballot, we are still proceeding with this effort to develop a framework and the technical procedures uh, because this emanates from the 2018 bike ped plan that was adopted. And this is one of the priority tasks that the board identified uh, even before it authorized a proposed new sales test measure. So yeah, it was part of the countywide bike and ped plan recommendations. <clears throat> Leah. Can there be representatives from more than one RTPC? More than more than one representative from an RTPC. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, I will leave that question to the committee. Uh, we, we are not, that is our proposal, that there would be a representative from each RTPC, but if an RTPC feels that they don't, they don't have the resources available to commit a volunteer and another RTPC would like to bring forward two, we are not going to uh, preclude that option. In other words, the magic number is four, uh, but I, again, um, one of the options in the report is that it, the committee has the authority to modify the number that they wish to volunteer as well. I was just wondering if the magic number could be five or six, or could we have alternates if you don't like, you know, five and six? Now one. <laughs> Switching. Um, one of the caution that I would offer is that we do wish to keep a manageable number on the working group. Uh, anything over, we are looking at about 13 right now as it stands because we also will, will be recruiting from the CB pack as well as from um, advocacy groups and um, also looking to recruit from UC Berkeley uh, with the Safe Trek uh, Institute of Transportation Safety. So um, to that end, uh, we would like to start with an initial nomination of four, um, either today or at your next meeting with our TPCs. Yes, go ahead. And are you looking for people who are actually members of the TCC, or are you looking for people who are representative of the members of the TCC? We are requesting specifically from this body. Thank you. And an RTPC member. Is that correct? Correct. Do we, ha do we have any volunteers, or do we have questions still? I'm not turning Volunt on my mic for being a volunteer. I'm turning my mic on for one little question. It, it, <laughs> 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 no, um, it just seems like the TCC is the wrong place to be asking this if you're asking for someone from each of the regional transportation planning commissions. I mean, committees. It, it feels like that's where we should go. And that's just, that's just my opinion. But Well, the, as we see it, uh, each of the ITPCs are represented on this committee. Um, and that's why one option would be if you wish to ask you, there's a, with the primary and the alternate. Um, if this committee feels strongly that it should not come from this committee, then we can reconsider that and you'd rather pull from the deeper bench within the RTPC. But that is our proposal at this point. That's exactly it. It's just a deeper bench if you go back to yeah. it. So. Volunteers? John? Jerry? What you want to do with all this? Am I volunteering yet? No. No. <laughs> or do we nominate? Uh, Volunteer or nominate? No, but I, I guess I, we can, I guess going back to the question about whether they need to be on this Volunteer. committee or someone representing us. Um, Monique Sen is currently working on that, a Vision Zero for Contra Costa County, so it makes sense for him to be on a, this type of working group rather than have me go there, and then I'm going, you know, between Monish and I because, you know, he's already, in, he's already deep into this with the county's effort. So I don't know if that's up for discussion, um, but it, I, I guess I'd consider volunteering myself, but it, it makes more sense for Monish to go to those meetings. Uh, I mean, based on the discussion that I'm hearing just in the last couple minutes, it sounds like there's a, <laughs> there's, the feedback uh, is that perhaps uh, we could, we can, and there's, there's no reason why we can't make minor revisions to the scope to basically make it just four RTPC members um, that would be, you know, if that, if that were the preference, or an RTPC can opt to pull someone from someone other than the TCC. But they would, we would at least hope that they are um, familiar at, with, the, with the effort. So for one at Creek, the person that both Heather and I comes to mind is our traffic engineer who is a genius with this stuff and many other things, actually. Um, but she is neither on Transpac or TCC. But would be definitely the best choice. So. <laughs> Would Transpac agree? So the, 
Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I was thinking maybe we could have the RTPCs nominate a volunteer or <laughs> find a volunteer from each R have the RTPCs find a volunteer for this committee. So as this, well as the, this report, this item is, is based on a recommendation, but certainly this committee can modify that if it feels like there are other better options. So um, we are open to what Andy proposed and, and Jerry as well. Paul, Steve. I'm going to try and make this easy. I actually am the traffic engineer for Brentwood, and I'm working on it for Brentwood, so I'll volunteer if that's okay. We have transplant. And I sit on this thing, too. We so. have a transplant volunteer. I need to do better than that. There's one. <laughs> All right. Do we have more comments? <laughs> uh, I think it would, uh, I mean, I don't want to delay the process, but it, just looking at my West County colleagues, I think it would be maybe useful to have a little discussion at the WIC tac tac and what exactly does this entail and who would be best suited to take it on. So, I, I mean, we could... I think anybody who's here today could do it, but um, it might be good to do it that way. Yeah, as I understand it, there is there is um, one representative and one alternative from each of the RTPCs at the TCC for for the TCC. So that that doesn't have a lot of options as far as who from the RTPC is going to be represented on this committee. So it seems like. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of opening it up to more, um, to anyone on an RT, on attack on an RTPC. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, I would agree. So I think on the Safe Routes to School, the coordinating committee from several years ago, uh, it's kind of similar process, I think. It was opened up to relevant staff members who were, you know, working on that type of effort. So I totally support kind of going beyond this committee, especially because probably... A lot of us are going to be on the GMP committee and other things coming up, so um, I would support that. Can, can I just make one more comment? <laughs> <You're out>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is just another suggestion. I know you don't want the group to be too large, but maybe the county rep could be like a at large because you know they they touch all of the regions, and then there could be four from the others. That's actually how we, um, if it wasn't clear, um, that is on point. Um, we expect or we hope that a county representative could join the group uh, in that at-large role. So uh, hearing, is there any more discussion, questions? Okay. Um, I think the motion, do we have a motion to um, send this to the RTPCs? Eric? Yeah, I, I can move to send this back to the RTPCs and have them come up with their representative or volunteer, volunteer um, from, I guess, one volunteer from each RTPC and come back in a month. Would that work? That, that would be great. Right. Or, at your, or at your earliest next meeting when uh, approval can be had. Okay. Um, Mr. Hugh, I wonder if I might ask as a friendly amendment uh, to allow the RTPCs to have the option of choosing somebody who is not actually on their TAC. Right. Well, yeah, we can we can definitely include that. Just basically, a representative from the RTPC area, <laughs> not necessarily an RTPC member, um, but but yeah, I would second that. All right. Do we have uh, we have a motion and a second? Um, all approved. And oppose? Hearing none, it passes. Thank you, James. All right, next is um, the draft results of the 2019 CMP traffic monitoring. For this, we have Matt Kelly. Technical difficulties? There we go. Okay. Let's log into this thing and get going. Um, 
Good afternoon. I'm here to present the uh, draft 2019 CMP LOS monitoring results. As you may know, every two years as part of uh, the congestion management program update, uh, we go out and monitor the uh, freeway system, every, basically all freeway routes within uh, Contra Costa County and 65 intersections around the county uh, for their LOS results. They all have been assigned a standard. Those standards were assigned back in 91 when the CMP network was uh, designed. Um, and that network has basically remained unchanged since then, though we have added some monitoring sections on Highway 4 as the freeway expands uh, into Far East County. Um, as you may know, or as you, most of you do know, LOS at the state level is, is going away, at least under CEQA. Um, and we imagine that uh, one of these days it will go away as the, uh, as the standard uh, for the CMP. But those uh, two state, uh, uh, those, that legislation has not uh, caught up with the other legislation. So for now, we are still collecting LOS data around the county, uh, comparing it to previous years. Um, we are tasked with uh, developing deficiency reports. Should we find uh, intersections not, not meet their standard? Uh, we haven't had to do one in the past. Uh, what happens if we find uh, intersections that don't meet their LOS standard? We go out and recollect data at those locations twice two more times and if we if it comes out again deficient then we go ahead and do an exclusion study which basically excludes all regional traffic uh, traffic from uh, low-income communities there's a couple other factors so those exclusion studies have have you know we get so much regional cut through traffic around the county that those studies generally uh, clear the uh, location from having to do a, a deficiency study. Um, so also as part of uh, the intersection LOS, we collect those uh, bike and pedestrian counts. We've done that since 2011. Uh, so we've got a fair amount of bike and pedestrian data that we've collected. Um, and we make all of those count sheets and synchro sheets uh, available to you. We will be uh, posting the full report and uh, sheets to our website uh, shortly uh, in your packet is just a summary of the freeway and intersection uh, LOS results with uh, a comparison to the 2017 results. So let's get through this here. We'll start with freeway um, and well, Let's start with, in general, these are our monitoring locations. So you can see all the freeways are highlighted and then intersections around the county. And I say uh, not around the entire county because uh, Southwest uh, doesn't have any intersections. Uh, that was uh, part of the original design of the um, CMP network back in 91. and no one has requested to be added to the network since then. Um, and there's a lot of probably good reasons for, <laughs> for that. Um, and because, as I mentioned, this legislation will probably change over the future. We don't, we aren't asking anybody to join the, the CMP network at this time. We also have our MTSO monitoring that every other cycle is, every other CMP cycle, we do the MTSO monitoring so that uh, fills in the gaps in monitoring uh, around the county. Uh, so our freeway results. Um, this map is showing AM peak period. Uh, the red is LOSF. The uh, green is LOSA. And the other shades are in between. Um, you can see we have a fair number of LOSF locations. You know, you. you you all are, are probably very familiar with these locations. Um, the, the main culprits are I-80 westbound in the morning, SR-4 westbound in the morning, 24 westbound in the morning, 680 southbound in the morning. Uh, these are all the morning. Um, and uh, 580 towards the... Uh, towards Marin County at the Richmond-San Rafael Bridge. And that's our only really new location. 
um, that popped up in 2017, um, and it's since exacerbated. Uh, we we basically the trend for increased traffic has continued since 2017, though we have had some locations that have have slightly improved, and I'll get into that in, in just a little bit. Um, so here is where, uh, he, this is just highlighting the LOSF locations, those ones I, I just mentioned and the ones you're probably most familiar with. And a lot of these pop up on the Bay Area's, you know, top 10 uh, most congested locations. So probably no surprise to anybody. Um, here we have, uh, this is changes between 2017 and 2019. Um, so these are, uh, in green is where it's improved, uh, uh, and uh, the yellowish color, orange, is where it's uh, degraded. Um, and that uh, eastbound SR4 uh, segment has been getting worse year by year, but we have a project that we anticipate will have some very uh, positive effects on that uh, stretch of, of very slow moving traffic in the afternoon. Um, here is uh, what we call planning time index. We've started to introduce some other measures because LOS is so, you know, Boring. No, I won't call it boring. It's, it's but it's it's pretty standard. Um, these are, there's new measures coming out all the time. Uh, planning time index or travel time re reliability. Basically, the amount of time you need to budget uh, for getting from point A to point B. Uh, the thicker the line, the more time you have to budget into your travel time if you're going during the peak period. Um, these are just things we thought we'd include because um, they, they go along with the with the highly congested areas, but um, it's it it it's it can be a useful uh, measurement. And it, it it does get instead of just getting at delay, it gets at the the user experience. That's what people want to want to uh, know more about. What do I need to do to avoid you know getting stuck in this traffic or being late for work? Um, and here's duration of congestion. So the thicker the line, the the, the longer the duration lasts. So there, you know, there's some places where the duration is is uh, you know just an hour or so. But then there are spots where you know, like on I-80, where it seems to never uh, clear up. Um, this is PM peak period. Uh, so. Um, you know, it's a lot of it is is the reverse of what it is in the AM. Those same corridors that are clogged in the AM are again clogged in the PM. And I don't think we saw any new locations here from uh, 2017, uh, but we did see some, uh, you know, uh, get slight, slightly exacerbated. And here are the highlighting the level of service F. So we've got 80 eastbound. SR4 eastbound, you know, through Port Chicago Highway, um, and that's the one that we hope will be remedied by the um, by the uh, the interchange improvements at 684 uh, eastbound 24 and northbound um, uh, I680. And I should mention that the southbound I680 in the AM we hope will have uh, some. Uh, there will be some positive effects from the southbound uh, HOV express lane that's under construction right now. The northbound HOV express lane won't be uh, tackled for a few more years, so we'll have to wait on that one. Um, here's looking at the change from 2017. Uh, improvements in green, uh, de degradation in yellow, and there is that Weird one on 160. Um, I don't know if you East County folks would agree with that one. I thought it looked weird. Um, so I'm going to have our consultant re-examine re the PEMS data on that. Um, I just don't know that there's any um, congestion on southbound uh, 160 in the PM. They may be going slower than 65 because it's not actually, you know, coming across the, it's not a full freeway till you get into the county. Um, so maybe it's a product of just slower speeds. And here's that planning time index. So it's, you know, really showing that that 
SR4 uh, across the top of the county, getting through 680 and 242, um, and 680 northbound and 80 northbound. I'll, I'll work on getting some more differentiation in the, the widths of the lines there, because a lot of them kind of look the same. Um, so in the final report, I'll, I'll have them you know, vary the width based on, uh, based on the amount of uh, planning time needed. And here is the duration of congestion. Same with this. I, I think we need to work on the width of, of the lines because, you know, 80 is definitely has more duration of congestion than 24. We know that uh, for a fact. Um, you can see there on the, the section of four, you can see it's a much thinner line. And I think that rings true that it's worse west of uh, 242 in the PM than it is east of 242. So here are those locations that actually improved from 2017. Um, we had up in at the uh, northern edge of, of I-80, um, we actually went from level of service C to A. Um, I, you, we've never had bad congestion north of really Highway 4. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know what to say about that because um, congestion really is pretty minimal once you get past there. But... Now it, it appears to be very much free flow um, once you get past Highway 4. Um, so uh, let's see. Any of those, you know, if, if there's any of these that you disagree with, let me know and we can uh, re-examine those locations. But for the most part, they weren't Fs or anything like that. Uh, the only one that was even a E is the northbound um, El Cerro to Bollinger, Can Bollinger Canyon on 680. Um, I understand that the label should be reversed to reflect the direction. Bollinger Canyon to El Cerro, um, and that could be the addition of the um, auxiliary lanes through that section that have had a positive impact, but um, or, and maybe the congestion is mostly north of El Cerro. Um, but if, if you do disagree with any of these, um, please let me know. And yeah, Paul. Do you recall when ramp metering was implemented on State Route 4? I don't, I don't remember the date. Steve? Okay. Or yeah, was, probably was, before time, the last cycle. Time flies. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it does. I was going to say a couple years ago. Um, yeah, so the, some of these, you know, especially if it's just B to A, there's probably not a, a real reason. It's just, you know, it's just could have been a high B and now it's a low A, you know, so. But I just wanted to, uh, we did see some some improvements around the county. There were only a few places that degraded and a lot more places that improved. So uh, intersection level of service. I know this is kind of hard to read, uh, but uh, basically this, these are the intersections around the county. The red are the LOSF, and I'll, um, I can name those locations for you now. It's, uh, and this is the AM peak period. Basically, we've got, um, let's see, we've got uh, San Pablo Avenue at John Muir Parkway. Um, over at, and at the Highway 4 intersection, ba basically Highway 4 and I-80, where it uh, extends out and hits uh, San Pablo Avenue. Um, that is level of service F in both the AM and PM and was also uh, in 2017. But we, in 2017, we recounted it and it didn't come out. We, we've had some issues with the signal timing plans that we've got in our um, in our system, so I'm constantly asking asking Caltrans for their latest signal timing plans, and generally that's the issue up there because I haven't heard that there's a, a real problem at that intersection. Um, the next AM location is, let's see, uh, Treat Boulevard at Oak Grove in Concord. Um, we've got Ignacio uh, Valley Road at Ayers Road, also in Concord. 
and Ignacio Valley Road at the northbound I-680 ramps in Walnut Creek. That one, um, we believe the issue was with the construction on the BART station because the intersection geometry actually changed because one of the exits, I believe, was closed. I'm looking at the Walnut Creek folks here, but we, we do know the construction was going on and that intersection was affected, so we will be remonitoring that now that it, I believe it's it's to where it's, it's you know, back to its original configuration, or at least it's... It's back to a new configuration. Yeah. Um, and let's see, one more, North Main Street slash San Luis Road at the southbound I-680 ramps in Walnut Creek. And that one came up at F, but we believe it's because they monitored the wrong location there. They, um, and this has happened before. Uh, basically, they monitor the unsignalized portion the, the, where the ramp goes off of San Luis and not the actual intersection, because I don't believe that intersection has a real level of service problem. Um, and I'm only highlighting the ones that were level of service F where their standard was not F. So these all have standards of E. So there's lots of level of service F around the county um, that also have a standard of F. Um, so they're fine, <laughs> unless you have to travel through them, of course. So the ones I just mentioned are the ones that we're actually going to be out recounting um, uh, this month or, the, or next month. Um, and I believe that's all the locations, but let's go through the slides. So here's where we saw changes from last time in the AM. And like I, like I as you can see, I, those locations I just mentioned um, are new. Um, so we'll be uh, investigating those. And I assume probably those two uh, I-680 related ones will go off the map by the time we publish the final report. It's the one on Ignacio. Is that Ayers? Yes. What's going on there? I didn't. Never thought it was level of service F. I don't know. Abhishek, do you have any? It is The the a lot of it is it's the uh, quarry. It's quarry traffic. It's a lot of trucks that are turning in on to in that area. And also people trying to avoid Ignacio, and trying to find any optional routes, even if they can avoid like. 500 feet of Ignatia. So there's some crazy cut through going it's on really, there. Yeah. The, the ways effect. Matt, yeah, thanks for that feedback. Yeah. I was wondering, um, do we identify any that are on the cusp of failure so we can kind of monitor them and not get surprised in the... That's a good question. I can I can actually request that from the consultant to give us yeah some some e e minuses or d minuses where their uh, standard is is e. Um, that's 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 a good request. I will Thanks. I will do that. It's good to know when you're <laughs> about to get you know kicked out. Um, Okay, here's a PM peak period, and um, there's that John Muir uh, Parkway. Oh, and then one I neglected to mention was uh, it's San Pablo Avenue at Richmond Parkway, and that is new, and I, I'm not aware of there being an issue there. I'm not sure Jill is. That's not in Panola, I don't think, but it's Panola adjacent, or San Pablo. Um, it's adjacent to your jurisdiction. Um, is that a? Oh, okay. Good to know. Okay, and so um, every everywhere else we're okay. Um, I, actually, I do think that intersection. The reason I didn't highlight it is because its standard is F. Um, let's see if I can find that here. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, that's San Pablo at Hilltop. Sorry, San Pablo at Hilltop. And its standard is E, so we will be re recounting that one. But good to know that that look, seems accurate. Um, 
unless you have to drive through it. Uh, and here is the changes from 2017. And um, so there are a fair number that have uh, degraded since then, but also a fair number that have improved. Um, so um, it's a snapshot in time, what was going on in spring of this year. Um, as I mentioned, we do this every two years, and we have so we have several years of history. Um, if if you ever need reports, you know if you want, as I mentioned, the count sheets or the synchro files, we can provide those to you. Um, you know, there's nothing you guys need to do unless we actually find that these are deficient locations, and then we get to the deficiency study. But as I mentioned, these those exclusion studies that we run generally prevent us from having to do the the deficiency analysis. So. Um, we publish this report as required, um, but it's it's really just kind of so everybody has an idea of what's going on around the county. It's a requirement of, under the CMP, but we generally use our MTSO monitoring to really hold development, um, you know, to task for for uh, creating some of these uh, degraded intersections. Um, so. Uh, here are those recount locations, and I, I do need to add that uh, hilltop at San Pablo to the list. Um, so um, that's all I have today. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Matt, one thing, if, if I caught this right, 580 West, the 580 westbound in the morning was getting worse, but eastbound in the afternoon was getting better? It, it seemed like the they added a lane there uh, across the bridge in the PM. Oh, well, maybe. And when I say they, it's it was MTC, um, and uh, so traffic has definitely improved in the eastbound. Uh, they have a, a new ramp that kind of uh, goes directly to Richmond Parkway, and that's where most of the traffic goes. So, and what we found is that there is more traffic up Richmond Parkway, and maybe that's what's impacting that uh, hilltop intersection up there. Um, so the traffic's got to go somewhere. But Marin got its way on the on having that third lane on the eastbound direction. So. Um, what, what are you doing with this next, Matt? Are you taking it to all the way up through the committees and then to the CCTA board, or? We, we do take it to them as an information piece and then uh, it generally as part of the CMP, um, but they usually just kind of take it as information and um, usually they don't get really interested unless we do need to, a deficiency uh, situation is, is found. Okay. But as I said, we've been able to avoid that. Well, part of the reason I was asking is um, Tim was at our City Council on Tuesday night, and there was a lot of conversation about what has the measure done to improve congestion, and is it worth it to do a new measure? Because are we getting anywhere with the money that we're spending? And so if, you know, particularly some of these pieces where you're improving, you know, that could be a good part of the story. And I don't know if, um, you know, other city councils are going to have that same kind of opinion, but it, it really, you know, Tim had to spend way too long talking about how good the how much work how much advantage or how much you know benefit that the new the measure has done for traffic congestion so we just might want to think about that in terms of being strategic that, that's a really good point i don't know if if one cmp report could kind of tell that story but that you know that probably would have been a good thing for us to go around with looking at you know traffic since some of these Measure J projects w were implemented and how it is affected. Um, you know, by now, if a project was built 10 years ago, traffic could have come back. But at least, you know, we could say, hey, for five years after the project was built, you know, traffic was doing just fine. Um, we did present data to the authority last night on what the new measure could do to existing traffic, um, but we didn't go back in time. Can, can we share, can we get that information that, that, that was presented? Because Tim was mentioning that that was going to come Wednesday night and he was presenting Tuesday night, so that would be good information. Yeah, it's actually, uh, Terri-Ann just sent it out, I believe. It's 
posted. Uh, it's it's a PowerPoint. That's, the data wasn't in the staff report, but the PowerPoint was just posted this morning. So, yeah. Thanks for the report, Matt. Just a quick comment. So we've gotten, um, I think we had one presentation so far from MTC, kind of like at the six-month mark after the express lanes open on 680. And for northbound, I mean, it's showing that the, the delay starts a little bit earlier. I mean, it's basically nil, but it is a little bit earlier. So I, I am surprised to see that Bollinger to El Cerro actually improved a letter grade in LOS, although Bollinger to El Cerro, that's a really long segment. I mean, this is probably up in the Sycamore, El Cerro, Diablo area where the delay has started earlier um, with the express lanes. And it's not due to the express lanes, but it's just overall congestion. But just something to maybe compare with MTC's data as far as how the express lanes are operating and to this, um, just to make sure they're marrying up because we're going to be getting probably, I don't know, maybe every six months or a year getting a, a report from them on how they're working. So, Okay. I, I will, uh, same consultant, no, they're, they're working on the southbound HOV lane uh, or express lane study. But um, yeah, I will, I will have them look at that. And if we get any, I'll have them re-examine the PEMS. And if we have anything different, I'll, I'll let you guys know. Great. Any other comments, questions? Thank you, Matt. And Thank you. do we have any other business? Any other business? All right. Seeing none, we'll adjourn to the next meeting, October 17th. Thank you.